thanks, Ivana. Um, okay, so this is our June developer meeting. Um, so real quick updates on the data. Um, I think this month we are a little bit underwater. We have more PRs and issues created than closed. Um, so we need to take a look at that. Um, especially the issues in the last couple of days, we've had a big influx of new issues and new people contributing issues. So it'd be really helpful if um, the developers could take a look at some of those and see if we can't either get them resolved or convert them into discussions, um, et cetera. Um, another thing that happened strangely in May is we had a huge uptick in the number of clones for like two weeks, and then it went back down. Um, I don't know what it was, but we had this huge uptick for two weeks in the um, actions on our GitHub, um, but now it's back down to below that. So. Maybe someone had a project that was due based on Gem5 at the end of the term. Not sure. Um, okay, so the big thing is that we're going to do the v24.0 release imminently. Um, basically, we have to get our tests passing, and then I think we're good to go. Um, so we really need to do this within the next week um, because we're having a tutorial at ISCA, and I would really like to use v24.0 for that tutorial instead of having to use develop. Um, so I really would like to compress the time between creating staging and doing the release um, and get this done as soon as possible. Um, so on that note, is there any PRs that are not tagged as v24.4 that we're waiting on? Uh, there's just my multi sim cleanup, and that's it. Okay. I mean, about on my play, I mean. Uh, there is also the chai work by Thiago, which I'm not sure is actually tagged as 24.0. Um, which PR? Is I'm not sure. Um, is the one that basically is sparking this discussion here with about uh, refactoring, uh, creating this chai. Gotcha. Yeah, that's. Is the one I'm gonna talk about today? Is Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely not going to get into twenty four point zero. Yeah. Yeah. We. I think we. Yeah. There's more stuff that we need to upstream to for that to be usable. So I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's that can go. Um. But there's a bunch of other PRs up here, it and some of them sound like bugs, so it's not really clear to me what needs to be merged and what can be put off until after the release. So if you have a PR or someone in your organization has a PR, let us know if it needs to get in. Otherwise, I would say most of these are not going to get in to the release. So the, the default will be not getting into the release. Um, OK, cool. So kind of relatedly, so um, the test failing, oh, sorry, this is Oh, well, um, test failing are, it, it has been a perennial issue for us, but it's been particularly bad over the past month. Um, so our daily tests have not passed for almost an entire month now. Um, the last time it passed was 358, which was on May 16th. Weekly tests haven't passed for two months. Um, there's a couple of causes of this. One is that there's definitely some flakiness in GitHub Actions. Um, things like downloading the artifacts that we create fails sometime for no particular reason. Um, this morning, it looks like it failed to clone jump by for some reason. Um, but it even worse is that there's compounding bugs in here. So someone pushes something that causes a bug, it causes failing tests, and then other bugs get pushed in on top of that. So by the time we try to do a blame or, or a bisect to find out what the problem is, there's multiple problems, and it becomes very difficult to catch back up. Um, so I guess I'm looking for input from the community 
on what we can do to try to improve the stability here. Um, I think there's a problem with GitHub that we don't seem to be getting notifications about this. Um, so if anybody has an idea on how to fix that, it would be greatly appreciated um, or other ideas. So, so I, oh, sorry. Oh, I guess I'll just say a quick, uh, cause mine's a little bit short. Uh, I was, I've been playing around with uh, GitHub ops that are kind of starting to be more widely used. And there is one that literally uh, you can basically have a button on the Jam5 uh, repo that you can like stop merges until certain things are resolved. Uh, so we have talked about this before that uh, maybe if these tests fail, we just block merge merges onto the develop branch until they're resolved. And that would solve, I mean, at least part of your problem. Um, right, that would fix the compounding bugs issue. Well, that does appear to be your major, that, that is your major point, right? Yeah. yeah. So I have two questions. So the first one is, um, uh, do you know which test is failing? Um, because uh, I'm actually relatively new to GitHub Actions and I just try to look now and- yeah, So um, um, I, I, can I, I oh. here, let, let, let me share that screen real fast. I think it'll be easier to look at it. Um, so the only, sorry, I, um, it is a mess, right? It looks more of a mess than I think it actually is, but we've got for the daily tests, I think there's actually only one bug in there and that's the artifacts not being downloaded correctly. So that's not, well, maybe that's true today. Yeah, that's, that's true. That was not true yesterday. Let me try um, failed recently. So I, here, for instance, is the output that you should be able to see this, Chakama. In fact, everybody should be able to see this. If not, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, so this is what the output is. And it actually shows all the dependencies between things and what's failing. And so you can click on this and see the particular test that's failing here. Click on that and see the output here. So this was uh, th 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 this bug was fixed, so just FYI. But yeah, I know. But th this is answering Giacomo's question of how to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so so this failed because of a timeout, which unfortunately we don't get very good data on afterwards. Um, but if it fails for other reasons, we actually package up all the output directory and you can download it and look at it. Um, that would show up like at the bottom of this page here. Um, oh, not this page. At the bottom of this page has all of the um, outputs of tests that are um, failing. Um, annoyingly, these expire pretty quickly, um, but you can grab them if we see it um, relatively quickly. So this problem was introduced a month ago because it, with a uh, um, and it caused a timeout in the long test lib that was not caught by anybody. Um, I don't know what's going on with the weekly tests. The weeklies are working now. You can you can ignore the past two failures. That was me fiddling around with things. The ones that actually run when they're supposed to run on the test they're, they're supposed to be running, they've all passed. Okay, great. Yes. But you know, it's I I, I think it's it's embarrassing as a project that we go two months without our tests passing. Um, so I think as a whole community, we need to try to um, improve this. Did I answer your question, Giacomo? Yep. Okay, cool. Do you have access to this page? Uh, let me have a look now. Uh, I can let you know later. Uh, no, okay, so... yep, sounds good. Um, so I think, Jagami, you said you had two things. One was how to... Yeah, no, but you already responded to the second one. So okay. that's fine. So, I mean, I one of my hesitations with blocking all commits is that this is a little bit flaky. And sometimes pet tests fail for no good reason. Um, if you look at the, the most recent nightly or daily failure, it's because um, 
uh, we didn't, it, it failed to check out Gen5, like the, the checkout action failed. Um, and also our, we run these, we use self-hosted runners, which are hosted at Wisconsin. And that computer gets reboot once a month. And every time it reboots, none of our runners come back up. And so we have to manually do that. So then there's a couple of days in there that our tests might fail. Um, so that's what I'm saying is blocking all commits would solve the problem, but it could cause some significant frustrations in that we'd be blocking things for no good reason sometimes. So um, I will just say counter, slightly counter these two things is, I think what we don't do enough is, uh, is actually quite easy in actions to just very quickly rerun the ones that have failed, which I try to do if the tests have failed. And if it's flaky, you normally just get through uh, on that case. And, but secondly, the process I kind of uh, was looking into, it is quite manual. Uh, like someone goes in and kind of presses this button. And then when people try to merge a PR, there'll be a basically a warning or an error or something come up, comes up and said, sorry, merges are blocked because of this reason. Um, but I don't see like your complaint is we're not fixing bugs until other things have been committed. And either we just fix bugs faster or we stop things being committed. There's, there's, there's only two sides of this equation, right? Yep. I do agree GitHub could be a lot louder when tests fail. It just, they just seem, everything seems to be, it, it, it's very loud about things you don't care about and then silent about things you do, but yeah. Okay, anybody else have thoughts on this? My thought is that, uh, as you said, like, um... When you say like it can be a bit annoying uh, when it comes to, I'm talking about the daily tests in particular. When you say like it's annoying that you have like people that have like their pull request block, I think it gets worse when you have like all these issues compounding after days after days, because then you need to spend lots of time on trying to understand what was the problem. But if you actually start implementing this policy like on a daily basis, then it's relatively easy. You can have a quick investigation and if you don't manage, you can revert temporarily the pull request until someone can. And reverting the pull request um, basically can uh, unlock uh, the pull request merging from other people. And then the person who is supposed to maintain it can actually, or the creator of the pull request can actually have a look at it and fix it. So I think like if you do, we do this like uh, systematically on a daily basis, it's probably uh, less intrusive as I think it is. Um, also, I'd like to add that um, if there is like a sort of, I'm going to try to familiarize myself with GitHub options um, because I'm honestly not an expert on it. Um, but uh, if you happen to see like some like arm failing test, whatever, like feel free to add me, to ping me and I'm happy to have a look. Um, I think this is something that should be fixed by maintainers who are maintaining a specific area. And that's why I was asking like, you know, which tests are failing because um, if you uh, if we manage actually to uh, allocate the issue to like a sphere of maintenance, then it can be sorted out quickly, hopefully. And I think one of the issues is like the difficulty to actually have ownership, like give specific ownership for a problem, right? Because if it's just there and I see like something is failing, people don't know, is it up to me to actually fix the problem or is it up to someone else? And eventually it will all be, the burden will all, always be on you because like you're basically maintaining the infrastructure, right? So I think that if you want, want to offload um, most of what you're doing now on fixing bugs, I think we should be a clearer ownership of problems. On the terms of ownership, I don't have a solution to this, but what if anyone can figure out a solution to this, I'd be very grateful. I'd like to know what PRs have been introduced given a certain uh, nightly run of tests. Because that information is strangely hard to get. And uh, that would help us, op when we do figure it out, it's often very clear what PR has caused what bug. But, and there's only so many PRs to get merged a day. And the daily tests run daily. It should be very easy to figure out, but it's just not. So if anyone, 
I, I guess me, I'm probably the most up to speed with GitHub Actions here, so maybe it does rest on me. But uh, there's information like that where it's actually hard to even know what code has caused the bug sometime. The x86 bug we were battling with over the last week was kind of an example of this. Um, it was a PR that just, yeah, we didn't really know, or we didn't, we didn't know where, where in the code base this error kind of sprung from. Yeah, the PR, like in that case, the PR was on base or, or, or on the CPU, but then it only manifested in x86. So it was not obvious at all who was the owner for that. Um, but I do think if you can get it down to like five PRs, you're often could take a pretty good guess. <laughs> it's just that even that's sometimes hard to get. Okay, well, I think that's um, helpful. So we'll see if we can implement this blocking button um, in the future so we can uh, better deal with this. Uh, okay, cool. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Tiago and or Shiakuma to talk about um, adding a generic Chai controller as a stepping stone to Ruby Classic. I'm very interested in this. Yeah, I can share my screen real quick. I have a couple of slides. Okay. You should have permission. Great. Can you guys see it? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so as uh, Jason was saying, we our goal here is to provide a generic Ruby controller that we can use to interface with, uh, to interface Ruby slash CHI with other protocols outside of the Ruby domain. And an ongoing uh, work on this is interfacing classic Gen 5 at the cache level with Ruby plus HI. So for example, you could have a cluster of cores in Gen 5 Classic or a single core, and you want to connect that after the L2s into Ruby. Right now, that's not possible. You can only connect the core directly to Ruby and have all the cache hierarchy implemented within Ruby. But hopefully with this generic controller, we could do this uh, connection at any level. And we have an initial pull request with a initial implementation of this generic controller. Uh, if you guys want to check it out and uh, give feedback. So yeah, before so you, yeah, uh, you, you might be talking about this in the next slide, but um, can you talk more about what the motivation behind this is? Yeah, the motivation is being able to integrate basically at any level. So to give an example, right? You could have a system, a single core system that you created in Gen 5 using classic, and you have that calibrated to match the performance of the actual real system you're modeling. And now you want to scale that up. You want to connect that single core system. You want to, from that, you want to create like a 64 core system. You want to plug that those cores into a CHI configuration. But to do that, you will lose the calibration that you have made earlier because now you are not using the caches that you were using before. You're using the Ruby caches, which behavior is slightly different than the classic ones. So you have to recalibrate your your configuration, right? So so that, that that's one case. And we another case is to integrate external uh, devices that already talk CHI, for example. Uh, system C devices using the CHI TLM interface, right? Uh, it would be a lot easier to create a translator from CHI TLM to CHI Ruby if we already have a generic controller interface. So specifically for classic, I, I just, I'm, oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, can I just add an extra, an extra an, an, another use case? So I just uh, posted um, on the chat there is this issue from this um, Shanzi, uh, it's a, someone on GitHub who actually opened this issue and it's basically try to connect an external uh, microarchitectural simulator of a RISC-V core to basically uh, Ruby Chai. And he was basically interested in this work because he's basically f uh, facing the same problem, which is basically um, having a sort of uh, 
uh, external CPU with external uh, topol cache hierarchy, like maybe L1, L2, and basically wanting to connect from that into Ruby without, of course, passing through the sequencer because the sequencer is purely a, a Gen 5 uh, abstraction. So yeah, so this is basically a way to be able to use Ruby without the sequencer abstraction that requires you to generate a Gen 5 packet. And um, as Tiago Tiago said, there could be cases where uh, this is actually not necessary or maybe that's not the best approach. And yeah, you basically summarize which are the cases. And this was uh, the one I posted was like a, another example other than the one you already mentioned. Yeah, thanks. I think that makes a lot of sense. The external things make a lot of sense. Um, I guess I'm still a little bit, uh, and we can move on, but I guess I'm a little bit concerned about specifically the classic caches since they already have this weird, noisy uh, coherence protocol baked into them, which that coherence protocol doesn't seem compatible with CHI. Yeah, that's a good point. It's not 100% compatible. Yeah, in fact, we have made some tweaks to the classic caches to allow a more allow some sort of compatibility. I'll, I'll summarize some of the changes that we okay. made, cool. made there. But yeah, we haven't upstreamed those yet, but but those are in the queue for upstream. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the insights. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, before I go ahead, I just want to just go over how Ruby and Classic Gen 5 integrate right now, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So hopefully as everyone is aware that Gen 5 has this built-in memory interface, right? Where you encapsulate requests into packets, you send the packet downstream and you get a response packet with the response for that request. And usually you send that through the timing interface, right? And you get the response at a different time, or you can use the function or atomic interface where uh, the, the packet itself becomes the is converted into the response packet. So in general, that's that's how it works. So for that to interface with Ruby, we have this special uh, component called the Ruby port, which will convert these Gen Five packets into Ruby request messages and. We have different specializations of this Ruby uh, port, depending on which device you are connecting to the Ruby system. So the big, the biggest one is the one we call the sequencer, which uh, will convert basic reads and writes and atomics coming from the CPU into a Ruby request that is queued into these objects called message buffers that are then consumed by whatever cache controller you have connected to the message buffer underneath, usually the L1i or L1d cache controller. And when that request completes in the cache controller, you have a callback to notify the sequencer. And then the sequencer generates the uh, response packet for the CPU. And you have a different specialization. So for a DMA sequencer, you only have support reads and writes. You don't need to support atomics. And you have another one for, for GPU, which I'm not uh, exactly sure which request it supports, but I would assume it's more or less the same as the uh, CPU sequencer. Yeah, any question here? I'll just briefly say the GPU coalescer also does coalescing. So it takes yeah, 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 it does. All, all the different requests from the different processing elements and coalesces it like a GPU coalescer would. Yeah, yeah. All right, so yeah, let's go to the actual pull request. So what we upstream right now is a what we call a CHI generic controller, which is basically a specialization of abstract controller. So if you never use Ruby before, usually you implement these cache controllers in a different language called Sleek, and then that gets compiled into C++. So from this leap code, from this leap code, you generate one specialization of this abstract controller that implements your cache controller. Uh, and that includes all the state machines for, for your cache controller, and plus all the boilerplate code that is needed to attach the cache controller into the 
uh, Ruby network. So basically, the CHI cache controller defines only this boilerplate code, which is more or less stuff that we copy and pasted from whatever is leak generates. And the only thing you expose is an interface to send CHI messages and uh, receive uh, and callbacks when you receive a CHI message. So we have one function basically for each of the CHI channels, which we have four requests, snook, response, and data, and then one call callback with four uh, received messages on each of these uh, channels. And yeah, this is just a snapshot of the Python side of the cache controller. So you only have one parameter, which is the width of the data channel and then the uh, parameters for the input and output uh, message buffers that get connected to the Ruby network. And the machine type for the cache controller is defined by whatever uh, specialization you have for this uh, generic controller. So, so can you explain why we need to expose these um, functions? Yeah, so basically, yeah, we want to convert whatever messages are generated by the external device, right, into CHI uh, messages into either CHI request message, uh, CHI response message, or CHI data message, right? So the next step is to specialize this generic controller to do the conversion. Then the generic controller itself is just like the back end, so you can send these messages through the Ruby network. So is this kind of like implementing the in port, the, the um mandatory queue import that is in the um l1 controllers that the sequencer interacts with mm, um yeah it, it would implement i would say the sequencer it, it would be more or less like a sequencer plus l1 interface that would convert these packets or whatever format is used by the external device directly into CHI messages. So typically here, right, the sequencer, here Gen5 packets are converted by the sequencer into this generic Ruby message, which is re read by the cache controller, which would then convert that into whatever message is being used by the coherence protocol that you are, that you compiled. Right. But here with this generic controller, we want to convert, for example, for, for the generic Gen5 adapter, we want to convert Gen5 packets directly into CHI messages. So we, why <laughs> but why does it not work to use the sequencer? I mean I I, I believe you, like that that's yeah, yeah. I kind of understand the motivation, so the but I'm trying to understand better. Um, so this, so can I just jump in? Uh, sorry, Tiago. So yeah. the sequencer is basically translating. First of all, it works as of now only with a, a yeah. memory request from the load store queue, so they are written writes. So it, it already not it does not support, for example, classic uh, uh, coherence message, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like uh, one example. So even like if you want to connect it with the classic, uh, the current sequencer wouldn't work because it will just expect a read on a write, and then the logic downstream will make the conversion. So that's already something that breaks uh, things as they are. And then there was the other use case where you basically want to implement, uh, uh, to want to connect uh, Ruby Chai with other Chai implementations. Um, and if you already have like a, a different implementation in an external tool, um, there's no need I mean, it doesn't make any sense that you have like a chai um, implementation, a chai re a request, then you translate into a Ruby packet and then to go back like, so if you go back into the interface, what it is, it's really like a point of injection. We really basically want to sub out a very, very minimal interface where you just want to say, hey, I want to inject these Ruby messages uh, inside the interconnect. 
so that they can be processed. Um, and th th this doesn't require um, uh, the sequencer or uh, the other logic that you were uh, referring before. OK, I think I get it. Yeah, that that, that, that all makes sense for sure. Yeah, and you, we also want to cut off this middleman here, right? Because okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. CPU would the sequencer would convert a Gen five read the packet into a Ruby request load, which then again gets converted in the case of CHI into a CHI read shared, right? We want to be able to convert a read request directly into a CHI uh, read. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, um, with the Ruby, sorry, uh, the generic controller just has the interface to inject messages, right? CHI messages into the Ruby network. And then to actually convert an external protocol to CHI, we need an specialization. And for the case of the classic plus Ruby, we would have, this is not upstream yet, by the way, but it's upcoming a, uh, gen, what we call a generic requester, uh, which can, uh, which impl partially implements some of the CHI flows. So you can initiate a CHI transaction using high level functions like initiate read transaction, initiate write transaction, initiate data less transaction, and then callbacks when the transaction completes. So you, you can work at the transaction level rather than individual messages. And, and then specializing the generic requester, we can have a generic sequencer that then can convert uh, Gen5 packets directly into uh, CHI transactions. And hopefully these will support all the possible uh, Gen5 packets, not just basic uh, reads and writes generated by CPU, but also all the cache maintenance operations that the Gen5 caches can generate, like evict requests, write back requests, uh, and everything. Uh, any question here? Does it make sense? Hopefully we'll be upstreaming these guys soon as well. Yeah, if not, I'll just go uh, move on to the last slide. So as Jason mentioned earlier there, the coherence protocol implemented by the classic caches is very specific and not it's not fully compatible with CHI. So we also gonna push a couple of changes to the classic caches themselves. So in general, these are the changes that were needed. Uh, being able to, for example, force a write back clean uh, for packets that you have in the exclusive state uh, or if that is equivalent to CHI unique clean state. Like classic caches, for example, they would just drop cache lines, right? That are that are clean. They will not write back. So, which is something that is expected in CHI, at least in our implementation. So we need a way to make sure that the classic caches perform this write back when before dropping the cache line. A couple of additional information we need to append as well into some packets, for example, clean evict packet. Uh, so we we know what was the state of the that that was that the line that is being evicted was before the eviction. Um, allowing receiving data in the owner owned state, which is equivalent to CHI shared dirty state which is something that is possible in CHI, but it's not allowed right now in the classic caches. You always receive, if the data is shared, you always receive it uh, clean. Uh, and yeah, while we were testing the integration, we also found, found a couple of hazards and deadlocks involving pending requests and express snoops. This is not specific to the uh, classic plus Ruby integration, but I, I think probably the conditions for these deadlocks to happen uh, are not exposed if you have just ca uh, classic caches. 
And yeah, and, oh, and the, all these new behavior is parameterizable. So if you don't care about Ruby, you just want to run vanilla configs, it, it wouldn't be affected by these changes. You would still, you wouldn't see any change in time in your performance. So yeah, that that's, I think that's it. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to push this soon. Um, any question? So um, a couple of really high level questions um, slash concerns. As mm -hmm. first, I think this is really cool work. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense and I'm excited to see it upstreamed. Um, yeah, th this is really good. Um, my question, so, so two questions. The first one is, so what's your longer term vision with the memory system in Gen 5. So this is, you know, kind of taking Ruby away from its generic thing, right? Like if we had, if this had been done in Mark Hill and David Wood's group, this would be a generic thing that works across all protocols, not just CHI. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the whole classic caches and Ruby, that was always supposed to be a limited time thing. We weren't supposed to have these two different memory systems living next to each other forever. At least that was the vision, what, 15 years ago um, when they did the integration of gems and M5. So given these changes here, like, yeah, what's your vision in the long term? Mm, in terms of allowing flexibility in which coherence protocol you want to have underneath versus uh, the interface that Gen 5 provides? Well, I, I mean, kind of like, I, I wouldn't be surprised to hear the answer of, you think we should get rid of classic caches, get rid of all other Ruby protocols except for CHI, and then go forward with just CHI and Gen 5. <laughs> like that, I, yeah, <laughs> that could well, be a future vision. I think there are cases where you don't want to have CHI, right? All across the board, right? Especially if you're modeling, if you want to model a very specific system, a core that is very tightly integrated with the L1 cache and the L2 cache. Uh, in that case, having those caches being part of a super generic coherence model might not be the way, right, to model that kind of system. Right. And it seems like that's where you're kind of going. And, yeah. and that isn't using the classic caches for that, right? That's using... I mean, it could be using the classic caches uh, or something else, some external model. Right, right, right. Yeah, but in terms of for the like shared memory subsystem, I guess, I mean, my vision is, ob vision is obviously biased because I'm at ARM. <laughs> so I'll I like to see CHI as the standard for that. I think right now uh, we are in a state where the model is pretty flexible to model different things that are maybe not necessarily CHI compliant, but you could easily add other stuff ex and experiment with new things. And on on that end, I mean, very long term, I would like to maybe re-implement the whole thing in just pure C++, get rid of Sleek, which we found ways to uh, implement CHI on Sleek in a way that is extendable, but still you have that legacy state machine format, which is not necessarily the best abstraction, I think, for uh, this kind of uh, protocol. Because if you, sure. if you yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I, I was just kind of getting, I, I wanted to know. What you're doing, I think that um, again, I'm really supportive of this, but it does add yet another layer of maintenance. Yeah. So now, essentially, we have three different first-class memory systems. We have classic caches, which we need to maintain. We have Ruby protocols that we need to maintain, and now we're essentially having another cache system, which is CHI, which is, I think, at this point, almost different enough from Ruby that. It's its own chunk of maintenance. 
Um, but actually, like most of the logic will be reusing Ruby. Uh, the only thing that is actually replaced is the sort of uh, translation from Gem5 into Ruby itself. So it's just like the, the initial part, but then like the entire inter the interconnect, like the home node and uh, also other requesters will still be using um, uh, the same um, Ruby file. So um, it's not really a substitute, let's say. It's more like uh, chai ruby dot one in a way, um, just like a different way to actually interface Ruby. Uh, having said that, I understand the maintenance cost, but uh, my vision, um, I'm not maybe referring to the sort of logic that would be needed for uh, example, for example, like integrating it into classic. But if you take uh, like the minimal thing, like for external tools and to be able to directly inject um, chai transactions into Ruby from C++ without uh, requiring this sort of uh, translation layer, might actually make it uh, paradoxically easier to actually test Ruby, for example. And, and I'm talking, of course, about Chai, because the moment you actually can inject a transaction, you can basically write some tests that are issuing a specific request and then basically monitoring which are the response. So you can easily write some unit tests, uh, which are basically like uh, transaction specific. So if anything, if done properly, can actually help us finding a lot of bugs into Ruby Chai. Yep. Yeah, I agree with all that. But I think that, you know, Chai is now specialized enough that it almost has its own set of things that are distinct from Ruby. Uh, you know, like what you were describing there, that only applies to Chai. It doesn't apply to anything else in Ruby. Um, but it, yeah, anyway. Um, okay. And then my other question is, so there's been a push and it started years ago and it has um, languished for a while, which is completely my fault. Um, to do a generic, um, to have a single Gem5 binary, which has all the Ruby protocols in it. I worry that the these specializations for CHI are going to make that a lot harder. Um, you know, one of the difficult things um, with that was because, like, usually, and when you do every Ruby protocol, you have the L1 cache has the same name. The messages have the same name um, in each different thing. And so like having these names hard coded now, I worry is going to make the vision of having a single Gen 5 binary for all the protocols much more difficult. I don't know if uh, you have any thoughts on yeah, that. Uh, I mean, you, you, you could have that, right? But if you have a configuration that has a specific device that connects through these specific CHI interface, then yeah, then you 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 have to run with the CHI protocol, right? You can't run no, with so, so I think you're misunderstanding. So there's this PR that was created very early, um 117, um, which makes it so we can build a single Gen 5 binary with all the protocols in it. Yeah, yeah. Um that's a huge PR and uh, rebasing it is going to be a massive pain. I worry with this change that this PR might need to be completely scrapped and start over. Um, rebasing so, is going to be even harder. So I haven't looked properly at the PR, um, but I don't think it will be an issue. I don't think it will complicate things further than what they are now because the change are not residing into the slick files. So there is no like um, magic behind that. But, um, yeah, but the problem is that the names and the slick files are leaking out into Gem5 and that's unlike any other protocol. And so um, a lot of what was in this PR was, change, was changing the names, changing the way the names are generated in the C++ code from Slack. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if that requires some names to be changed, then I mean, the... The changes that uh, Tiago implemented with all this work that did um, are literally residing in like, I don't know, three, four files um, and they're all in C++. Um, if something changes, I don't see, and like, like if you, yeah, uh, I mean, doing this requires to change some names, then you actually change the name of uh, 
um, and the name of the function or the method that is supposed to override and whatever. I mean, I don't see it honestly, unless I'm missing something, I don't see it as any different than someone changing like some uh, uh, APIs in the base CPU class. And then all of a sudden you're supposed to change also other classes which are overriding, uh, specializing it. Um, but I don't see it to be fair um, as being a big issue. Yeah, so I think the only, I mean, the only dependencies between this change and the what is leak already generates, right, is the machine type, which is really, which is something that you can assign to this controller at configuration time. So if, if this changes, it really doesn't matter. And the CHI messages, right? So we need to include in this guy, the file that are generated from this leak, from the CHI leak implementation. So maybe, this would need to change. This would maybe have a different name or be in a different namespace, but but that that's it. Other than that, I think it's all orthogonal. It, it shouldn't make that big pull request easier or harder. It should shouldn't affect that. I think. Okay. Sounds good. Yes. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. And it, I correct me if I'm wrong. I think the point of that pull request is that you can then at configuration time you choose which protocol you run with, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess, obviously, if you have a system which uses these controllers, you, I guess, you will get an error if you are not running with CHI. You say, you know, it's, you have to use CHI because you have a CHI device in your system. And right. I, yeah, that would be it, I guess. Okay, well, thanks for all that. Great information. Um, I will. So, does it make sense for people to review the PR now, or should we wait until the other changes are pushed? Um, I guess it would make sense to merge once everything is pushed. Just merging the generic one, I'm not sure would be of any use right now. But reviewing that pull request specifically, I think people can go ahead and have a look and because that that's not gonna change with the uh, upcoming uh, commits that we are planning to upstream. Yeah, Jack Mu can correct me if I'm wrong because he he's handling the upstreaming. Um. It depends on what's easier for reviewers, right? The problem with the GitHub is that it does not allow you to link pull request and. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, I thought it was better to actually upstream this initial bit um, as soon as possible so we could have discussions like this one uh, and then basically split the pull request. But uh, if basically the consensus is on basically having one big pull request uh, with everything inside, then we can go on this route. So um, just whatever other uh, maintainers feel like is the most appropriate way to actually go further. I mean, I would prefer one big pull request. I, I like to see how something's going to be used when I review it, rather than just reviewing the infrastructure without any use cases. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be my preference. And let's be honest, I'm probably the one that's going to have to sit down and review this. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I think I'm, uh, uh, other than you and Tiago, the only one here with deep uh, Ruby experience. Um, sure. But uh, one thing is like for the classic one, you we need to wait for uh, all the other um, changes that Tiago did. Um, but uh, uh, for connecting external Chai implementation to um, to Ruby, this one is probably more or less sufficient. Maybe there are some changes needed on the Python config file, but it's pretty much it. Um, so that was also one of the reasons why I pushed it uh, as of now, knowing that it was not complete. But yeah, we can, we can do like um, a single pull request if that's what uh, people prefer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would really prefer to see it, to see some kind of tangible use that I can actually test in the pull request. Right. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. but whatever that means, but whether it's just a, even if that's just a test, um, that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to bring up? I see a lot of 
new names. Thank you all for joining. Okay, well, so one last thing real quick is uh, the jump It's a question, sorry, from... Oh, yeah, go ahead. This wasn't from Colin. Oh. Ah. Is there a plan to remove classic memory? It sounds like no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, to add on what we were discussing uh, earlier, like about replacing uh, classic with Ruby, I think one benefit of classic is that it's inherently faster than Ruby, right? The way Ruby works with the state machine, right? Ruby, it's more detailed. So I haven't tested all protocols, but in general, for more complex protocols like Chai, you go way faster for with the classic uh, memory subsystem. And some people might be a, happy to stick with the classic one instead of using uh, a Ruby. I do wonder if it like, is you know, with these changes, I can kind of see maybe private caches, like maybe we rewrite private caches. So we have like a Chai private cache, L1, L2, and then which is not classic, but it's Chai specific. And then that's connects into Ruby. And that kind of becomes the default because that's fast for, you know, common, the common case of hits in the L1, L2 and the right level of detail for the other parts. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And also, I guess removing the classic memory would imply getting rid of Gen five packets and Gen five memory requests. I think that which is means we have to modify pretty much everything, all the core models, all the eyes uh, definitions. Like that, that would be very basically we implement Gen five. I mean, I would look at it the other way that we would replace some of the Ruby messages with packets like keep packets, but drop the source mem cache. Like basically just drop the coherence protocol from the caches. Um, yeah, I guess that, 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 that makes more sense. But keep everything else. Because I mean, the caches and the crossbars, th this has been a thorn in our side forever when trying to do high performance systems. Anybody have anything else? Okay, I wanna remind everyone, if you have not signed up for the Gym 5 Bootcamp and you're interested in coming to the Gym 5 Bootcamp, which is July 29th through August 2nd here at UC Davis, there's still like another week that I think the, that it's open um, for registration. Um, and everyone's invited. I do have a question about the Bootcamp. Sure. Um, is it is it mostly geared towards uh, kind of relatively new people? I know that there's like a student track and a professional track, but yeah, you know, if I've got a little bit of experience, what yeah, what would I hope to gain from it? So here's, I'll drop a link um, here. Uh, oh, that sorry, that's twenty two. My bad. Uh, Here's the 2024 link. Um, so this is uh, the tentative schedule. And so the first day or so is going to be pretty basic of like, what is computer architecture simulation? What is how to build and uh, get Gen 5? And then starting on day two, we'll start to go into a lot more detail about how to do development, how to add your own devices, how to extend different pieces of it, and then deep dives into things like the GPU model, the CPU models, the Ruby, um, how to extend ISAs, et cetera, um, for the rest of the time. Yeah, good question. OK, anything else? If not, thank you so much for joining, especially the new people. Um, and we will see you next month around this time. Oh, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Giacomo and uh, Tiago, for presenting that. Thanks to you. Bye. 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 Bye.